there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. Welcome to the program, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. Have you heard about the Democratic Party nominee for mayor of New York City? He has multiple names, a former lesbian wife. He loves communist revolutionaries, and he's formed a political alliance with Muslims. Sound familiar? Well, it's the face of the Democratic Party these days. Cliff Kincaid will call in to True News in about 10 minutes to give us a lowdown on the mysterious red commie uh, past of Democrat Bill de Blasio. Later in the program, Professor Jonathan Matushik will talk about how Muslims in Europe and America are waging cultural jihad against the West. What are the chances you will hear these topics on Fox News and CNN, MSNBC today? Dear friend, in the world of reporting the news, true news is David versus Goliath. Goliath has billions of dollars for TV studios, satellites, high salary anchormen and women, research departments, editors, production crew members, and so forth. True news goes up against the news Goliaths every day. And we do it by faith in the name of Jesus Christ and by the authority that is in his name. We trust in God that he will supply our needs. And how does God supply the needs of ministries that work in his kingdom? Well, the Holy Spirit nudges God's sons and daughters with a gentle impression in their spirit to donate. And I'm going to tip you off right now. I'm praying that a lot of people get nudged this week by the Holy Spirit. For some unknown reason... Donations to True News were less than normal throughout the month. Now, Thursday is the last day of October, so if you feel the Holy Spirit nudging you this week to support True News, make sure you obey and follow through with a generous gift. Remember, a good intention that is not carried out is no intention at all. You have to follow through. You may give online at truenews.com. Click on support. Consider becoming a recurring donor with a monthly pledge. PayPal users, our donation address is support at truenews.com. Checks, money orders, precious metals, foreign currencies should be mailed to True News, P.O. Box 690069, Vero Beach, Florida. 32969. And starting today, we are broadcasting at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on WWCR, World Band Frequencies 5070 and 6115. Now the news headlines. The NSA surveillance controversy worsened over the weekend. Spanish newspaper El Mundo said the NSA spied on over 60 million telephone calls in Spain and 46 million calls in Italy in one month. The NSA recorded the telephone calls between December 2012 and January 2013. They did take off New New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Uh, They noted where the calls were made, the series number of the handset used, and the number of the SIM card and the duration of the call. Spain's uh, Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy demanded that U.S. Ambassador James James Costos explain the allegations. Newspaper said the interception carried out by the United States includes the intrusion in personal information through the Internet browser, email, and social media networks. By the way, interception of telephone calls is illegal in Spain. The NSA denied that Mr. O was personally aware for years that the NSA was spying on the telephone calls of German leader Angela Merkel. German newspaper Bild reported the that NSA chief, uh, General uh, Keith Alexander, 
I briefed Mr. Obama on the operation in 2010. Der Spiegel said the U.S. started spying on Mrs. Merkel in 2002. European anger is simmering. German Foreign Minister Guido Vestavella said surveillance is a crime in Germany and American officials need to be brought to justice. This is going to get interesting, isn't it? Uh, Russia is taking advantage of America's growing unpopularity in the Middle East. London Sunday Times reported that Moscow is seeking to upgrade its military ties with Egypt. Russia wants greater access to the Mediterranean to bolster the Russian Navy's presence in the region. The Times said Russia is shopping for alternatives to its naval base in the port of Tartus, Syria. Vladimir Putin wants a bigger port that can accommodate bigger warships. The Times quoted an Israeli source as saying that the Syrian port is vulnerable, but the Egyptian ports are perfect. An Egyptian diplomatic delegation is in Moscow for meetings this week with Russian officials. The Times said the purpose of the trip was to lay the groundwork for a visit to Cairo by Mr. Putin. Meanwhile, Lieutenant General Kondrashov, deputy commander of Russia's GRU, Military Intelligence Agency, arrived in Cairo today for secret talks with the Egyptian military commanders. That visit was arranged by Saudi Intelligence Chief Prince Bandar bin Sultan. The Egyptian army is furious with Mr. O because of his support of the Muslim Brotherhood. Israel's TV Channel 2 reported that Egypt is eager to acquire Russian military weapons. Depka reported that Mr. O will announce in late December that he's reached a settlement with Iran over its nuclear program. Israel's TV Channel 2 also reported that Israeli security agencies repelled a cyber attack Over 140 senior Israeli officials in defense and security industries received an infected email from a German company. It had a Trojan horse virus. The recipients included project managers and supervisors of highly classified sensitive projects. Uh, Channel 2 said the sources of the cyber attack originated in Chinese defense companies. The Associated Press reported that a major Israeli highway was shut down after cyber attacks targeted the security cameras in the toll roads tunnels on September 8 and 9. The road remained shut for eight hours on the second day, causing massive traffic jams. Uh, An expert told AP that the attack was the work of unknown but sophisticated hackers. China and Japan traded belligerent accusations and threats over the weekend. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Obi told Japanese soldiers he's prepared to step up military responses to China's provocations. China responded by saying that if Japan shoots down one of its drones, that will be an act of war. Uh, Over the weekend, Japan twice scrambled fighter jets to monitor Chinese military aircraft flying near Okinawa. China responded by televising video of its submarine fleet firing off missiles from under the sea. I think we can see where this is going, right? Well, let's take a break. Cliff Kincaid will join me in a few minutes when I return to inform us about the Democratic Party communists running for mayor of New York City. I'm Rick Wiles. This is True News. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. What kind of preparation is required to preach God's Word? Listen to the Bible from 2 Timothy 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear from 2 Timothy 4 listen to the Bible it's great for the soul hear more at radiobible.org 
This is True News. We report the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. In this segment, we will give more news to you that the uh, mainstream news media will never report. Uh, One week from Tuesday, the voters of New York City will choose their next mayor and city council. The race is between Democrat Bill de Blasio and Republican Joseph uh, Lota. Mr. Loda is a pro-abortion, pro-gay rights, pro-gun control Republican. Okay, that's the Republican on the right. So now you see how far left this nation has moved. A New York Times poll released today shows Mr. de Blasio with a stunning 45-point lead over Mr. Loda. So who is Bill de Blasio? Does the public know anything about this man? Well, there's no better source to turn to for the answer than Cliff Kincaid. He is the director of Accuracy in Media. Website is aim.org. He's also the president of America's Survival. The website is usasurvival.org. So, Cliff, do we have another man of mystery ready to be elected to a powerful political office? You know, Rick, in a way we do, but I have to say this about de Blasio. After the New York Times, in a matter-of-fact way, disclosed some rather controversial things about his background, uh, like his, quote, honeymoon to Cuba, his fundraising for the communist Sandinistas, and his embrace of Islam as a political force, this guy didn't try to cover it up. He admitted it all, uh, and basically is proud of it. So... In this case, we got a guy who's running on his communist record. He's not trying to cover it up like Barack Obama did. Well, that tells me how far we've gone since Obama was elected. You can now now run openly as a communist. And he is. Uh, This is uh, extraordinary. You know, many people uh, may have gotten a whiff of what was going on in New York City earlier uh, several weeks ago when they were... Uh, debating uh, what was going to happen in the New York uh, City Democratic primary. And at the time, you may remember, uh, all the controversy was on another candidate by the name of Anthony Weiner. And he is the pervert. Uh, He was the pervert who was running. Uh, There was a lesbian running as well named Christine Quinn, uh, chairwoman of the uh, New York City City Council. And de Blasio was sort of a a dark horse. Uh, nobody thought he would pull it out, but he did. And as you say, he's uh, up 50 points in the polls over the uh, uh, a liberal Republican Loda. But, you know, on one issue, law and order, there is a difference. And this is where, as somebody who, I live in the D.C. area, but I love New York City. I go there pretty regularly. This is what concerns me about the Big Apple, because this guy de Blasio, yeah, he's going to tax and spend the city into oblivion and bankruptcy like Detroit. But you and I know what's important about New York City is that it is a major target of terrorist attack. This is the city of 9-11. And this is a guy, de Blasio, who basically wants to shut down the New York City Police Department's counterterrorism programs. Well, we, before we get to that subject, I, I want to talk about the background of this guy. First of all, let's start with his names. How many names has Bill de Blasio used in his life? I think three. Now, those are what has been reported. He started out as Warren Wilhelm, uh, then he became Warren de Blasio, then he... Uh, uh, or William de Blasio, then he became, actually, he shortened it to Bill de Blasio. Uh, he's had various aliases, and, and the reason why this is important is, here's a guy who has now admitted he went to Cuba on his, quote, honeymoon in 1994. Now, under what name did he travel? We don't know. We do know the trip was illegal. Uh, we don't know who he met with. Did he meet, meet with any fugitive terrorists down there in Cuba? Uh, He must have gotten in with Castro's okay. Uh, Does he have connections to the Castro government? I mean, these are all questions we ought to be uh, asking and answering, but instead uh, the media up there in New York are asking him questions like, oh, 
uh, if you win the uh, mayoral contest, will you ride a bicycle to work? And uh, what's your favorite pizza joint in New York City? Once again, we've got a candidate with multiple names. This is so similar to Barry Sotoro, alias mm-hmm. Barack Obama. Uh, multiple passports, multiple names. Um, his name has been uh, Viham. Uh, it's been Warren de Blasio. It's been Bill de Blasio, William de Blasio. And nobody thinks that's odd. Cliff, it, you know, I'm 60 years old. I don't know anybody that's had three or four names in their life. Well, this guy, this, and, and like Obama. Except or, spies. And like Satoro, uh, this guy is a security risk. And this is why it is so important uh, that we all uh, focus on what's happening in New York City. Uh, and this is why uh, uh, last week on uh, October 24th, my group, America Survival, held a news conference in New York City with people like uh, Pamela Geller, uh, Trevor Loudon. Uh, Joe Connor, who lost his father to a terrorist bombing in New York City, to try to get the media to start asking some basic questions about this guy. And instead, the only reporter who showed up from the Daily News decided to write an article attacking one of our speakers. Well, let's get into Mr. de Blasio's uh past. Uh, you mentioned he, he took his honeymoon. He went on his honeymoon to, to Havana. <laughs> Doesn't everybody go to Havana on their no. honeymoon? You know, um, how far back have you have you? Well, uh, do you know anything about this guy prior to his honeymoon in, in Havana? Well, here's the interesting thing. On September 23rd, of all things, the New York Times ran a profile about the guy and mentioned several things in his background that do not, for some reason, show up on his bio on his official campaign website. Now, this story, uh, it wasn't a hatchet job. It really wasn't critical of de Blasio. It just said, hey, this guy uh, back in the 80s went to communist Nicaragua to raise funds for the Sandinistas, went to Cuba, um, and... um, uh, he did a, did this or that, and he, he became a member of a communist-oriented solidarity committee where he talked about the potential for uh, political Islam having a major influence on the United States. So now this didn't really have much of an impact on the Times itself because just the other day they endorsed uh, de Blasio uh, for mayor. But uh, that gave us a start, and so we started looking into his background. We've developed a lot more information But, of course, there are still outstanding questions like, uh, why did he use three names? What did he do in Cuba? Uh, Why? But but here's the key thing, Rick. Despite all of this, he still says that he's a supporter of the communist Sandinistas. He still says that to this day he's influenced by liberation theology. And uh, uh, he still says, uh, oh, and, and but to top it off... He's got a wife who, get this, is a former lesbian. Now, that's interesting because, as you know, it's the uh, mentality of the homosexual rights movement these days that you cannot change. You cannot go from homosexual to heterosexual. In fact, they're trying to pass laws to prohibit counseling in that respect. Obviously, she's a victim of conversion therapy. Well, no, and that's the interesting <laughs> thing. Apparently, she uh, either she wasn't a real lesbian to begin with, but but it but or she's her, not a real straight now. Yes, who knows? But they have two kids, nice looking kids, and those kids are in the uh, campaign ads um, and making it seem like he's got this nice family. But here's the thing about her: she may be, may be even more radical than he is. She was a member of a Marxist collective called the Combahee River Collective. We've done some investigation of that, too, which was openly communist, calling for a battle against imperialism and the downfall of capitalism. So uh, it's what I call a Marxist power couple. Wow. Uh, That sounds to me like the uh, Hillary Clinton's vice presidential running mate for 2016. Well, Interestingly enough, de Blasio ran Hillary Clinton's Senate campaign in the year 2000. Why am I not surprised? No, you shouldn't be. And so this guy uh, really uh, 
has a future. And, I mean, uh, really, Cliff, I mean, if he's elected mayor of New York City, mm-hmm. he really does have the potential to be the vice presidential candidate with Hillary Clinton. Well, that or... Except if, she she's still a resident of New York, isn't she? Yeah. Well, yeah, now, she, would now, have to, she would have to move. Now, if she, though, here's the problem. If she... If she, for some reason, doesn't run, because, you know, just the other day, uh, even 60 Minutes started looking into the Benghazi cover-up. Uh, didn't mention Hillary's role, but, but uh, that, could, that could end up tainting her possible run for the presidency. So it could be that de Blasio would fill the void. But what we have to look at, at in the meantime is what's going to happen in New York City. Let me tell you, even in liberal New York City, under the liberal mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who, of course, is not running again. Yeah, he wanted to regulate the size of your soft drinks, and he wanted to interfere in your personal health choices and all the rest of it. But one thing Bloomberg did, he backed up the New York City Police Department and their tough counterterrorism programs. You know, they've had 25 terror plots in New York City since 9-11. He backed up the New York City Police Department Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, and de Blasio comes in, openly campaigns with a group called Muslims for de Blasio, promises to get rid of Ray Kelly, and says he's going to cut back and restrict the surveillance activities that have kept the city safe. When he says he's going to cut back the surveillance activities, specifically, what he's what is he talking about? Getting rid of informants, getting rid of activities where they uh, send undercover agents into the Muslim student groups and the mosques. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he's talking about. And we know that some of the bombers and terrorists come out of those student groups and the mosques. And Bloomberg knows that, too, and so does Ray Kelly. And that's why they've had a, a big program to send informants into those areas, into those organizations. But de Blasio pandering for some Muslim votes, says he's going to wipe it all out. Was de Blasio connected to Bill Clinton's pardon of some terrorists? This is another thing we raised at our... uh, uh, Was it the Puerto Rican terrorists? Bingo. This is what happened back in 1999-2000 when he was running, de Blasio was running Hillary Clinton's campaign for the Senate. You see, at the time, Hillary Clinton was a carpetbagger. She was new to New York. She wanted to pander to the minority groups, especially the Puerto Ricans, and they thought one way to do it would be to get her husband, Bill, then the president, to pardon these Puerto Rican FALN terrorists. These are people responsible for 150 bombings in the United States through the 70s and 80s. And yes, indeed, um, uh, the pardons took place. Bill Clinton would later pardon not only the FALN, but some members of the Weather Underground. And so what Joe Connor, who's lo- who lost his father in the notorious Francis Tavern bombing in New York City in 1975, said at our conference was, what did de Blasio know about these pardons, and when did he know it? But again, these are questions we're asking, and we can talk about, but the media aren't interested. Mm-hmm. Who is Donna Joan, is it Borup? Oh, Donna Borup. Borup. Okay. Well, these are, you know, many people think, well, those are the days of the Weather Underground, the Black Liberation Army, the Puerto Rican FALN. Those are the old days. The fact is there are several fugitives from justice during that time period. One of them is a woman named Donna Borup of the uh, May 19th Communist Organization. Uh, she's a fugitive. Uh, uh, she um, is on the run somewhere. We don't know where she is. The FBI is looking for her. She's She's uh, been charged with throwing acid into the eyes of a New York City policeman back in 1981. Uh, one of the FALN bomb makers um, uh, is actually in Cuba today. He fled to Cuba uh, with the help of the Weather Underground. Another fugitive from justice, uh, Joanne Chesimard, also known as jo- uh, Asada Shakur. She is a convicted cop killer. She fled to Cuba with the help of the Weather Underground. This is the milieu that de Blasio was operating in when he was an activist with a group called the Nicaragua Solidarity Committee, or Network. And we investigated this as well. This was a communist front set up by the U.S. Peace Council, which was dominated by the old Communist Party USA, a pawn of Moscow. This is 
This is the network de Blasio comes out of. If I mean, if you could believe it, Rick, he's probably uh, even more openly communist, more of a radical uh, than Obama himself. That's hard to believe. But but what what we have now is is that the present day Democratic Party is the Communist Party. I, I really believe it. The Communists decided decades ago they they realized they're never going to be elected in this country as communists. They infiltrated the Democratic Party. And over decades they took it over. And now we've got people openly running as as communists. They they don't they don't deny their communist sympathies and and uh, nobody's nobody's blinking an eye about it. It's it's quite normal now. This is uh, the case, certainly in the case of de Blasio. This guy's more open than anybody. The only thing he's expressed any regret about in his past was when he was a member of the New York City City Council. He was part of a group, including a former Black Panther, who welcomed the Marxist racist killer Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, uh, in a welcoming ceremony to New York, uh, New York uh, City Hall. And, and, and uh, de Blasio said, well, he, he probably shouldn't have done that because Mugabe was a little bit too controversial. But as I say, he's, he's not uh, backed off his support of the communist Sandinistas, says he's still influenced by liberation theology. And when he was quoted back in 1991 as embracing um, a global Islam as a rising political force, uh, he demonstrated that concretely a couple weeks ago by appearing with uh, a woman named Linda Sarsour of Muslims for de Blasio, and she's uh, an out-of-the-closet Islamist. You know, when you put this together, you know, the fact that the next mayor of New York City is going to be a a flaming communist, and then this unusual election in Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, Mm. of Shokwe Lumumba, a, a... a black separatist, a communist, a man who wants the South. He's not. He doesn't want Dixie. He wants. He wants an Africa, a new Africa, to to mm-hmm. rise up from the South. And he won with overwhelming support in Jackson, Mississippi. And Cliff, so city by city, we're seeing we're seeing city halls turning red. That's right, and and that's why this race is so important because. Of course, New York City, uh, with over 8 million residents, is not uh, some podunk town somewhere. Uh, This is the city of 9-11. And Trevor Loudon, who has talked about that case you mentioned and was at our conference on de Blasio, says what's happening to New York City with this candidate is the perfect storm. Uh, And... uh, so we've got the communists coming together, personified by de Blasio's past, present, and future, and you have the Muslims in alliance with him. And together, again, this is the critical thing, in dismantling the NYPD's counterterrorism programs and decimating uh, its intelligence bureau, you're setting the city up and the nation for another 9-11. And in the White House is the perfect political hybrid, a Marxist Muslim who's, who's in the White House right now and is orchestrating this, this alliance to dismantle the United States of America. Well, my, uh, my guest, Cliff Kincaid, if you want to read the details about Bill de Blasio, uh, Cliff has all the facts on his website, usasurvival.org. Thank you, Cliff. Been my pleasure. Thank you, Rick. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is True News. God's Word is clear. He loves you, and He's ready to help you answer His calling. Here's today's Moment with Charles Stanley. You see, you do not know what your potential is. Don't look back at your past and say, well, back yonder made this mistake, so did they. Well, back yonder I did this, so did they. The issue is, are you willing to line up today with the will of God in your life and discover what he can do, what he will do? You say, well, I don't know that God loves me all that much. Yes, he does. That is your thinking. You can never prove that with the word of God. 
What you have to ask is, what does the Word of God say? And the Word of God says very clearly that from God's perspective, what has He done? He has made you wonderfully and skillfully. That is, He hasn't left anything out. It's all there. Everything's there. Lining up with God's will begins with acknowledging who He is. Learn more in the Go Deeper section on our website, intouch.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. In the first segment of today's program, I reported that Russia is moving in quickly to fill the vacuum in the Middle East caused by President Obama's Middle East policies. According to the London Times, Egyptian officials are in Moscow today making preparations for Vladimir Putin's visit to Egypt. Simultaneously, the deputy commander of Russia's GRU military intelligence unit is in Cairo. The Times said Mr. Putin is shopping for Egyptian ports where he can dock large Russian warships. Russia's opportunity to become an ally of Egypt came about when President Obama angered the Egyptian army leaders by aiding the Muslim Brotherhood and by cutting off U.S. military aid to Egypt after the army kicked out the Brotherhood. Last week, it was revealed that Saudi Arabia is furious with Mr. Obama, and they have threatened to sever its special relationship with the USA. That's a not-so-subtle hint that the U.S. petrodollar uh, days are, are, are numbered. The Saudis are also flirting with Russia and China as potential new partners in place of the U.S. Meanwhile, Mr. Obama reportedly plans to instruct the State Department to relocate thousands of more Somali refugees to America. Over 80,000 Somali refugees are presently living in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota alone. And it looks like many more are on their way. In fact, the U.S. State Department announced last week that it has relocated 69,930 refugees in the U.S. this year. Most of them came from Islamic countries. Of course, it's very politically incorrect today to question such policies. My guest today isn't afraid to speak out. Dr. Jonathan Matutsis is an is a associate professor in the Nicholson Nicholson School of Communication at the University of Florida. He studies globalization, culture, and terrorism. His most recent book is Terrorism and Communication, a critical introduction. Dr. Matutsis, welcome to True News. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. And uh, for uh, uh, proper introduction. Uh, please, uh, please uh, pronounce your name correctly for our radio audience. It's Jonathan Matusitz. Matusitz. All right. Well, I'm getting there closer. Okay. But maybe by the end of the program, I'll have it down. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, may I call you Jonathan? That'll make it easy on both good. of us. Sounds okay. Good. All right. That's what my mom calls me. All so right. All right. And the IRS calls me Richard. Okay. <laughs> so the only people, the only people that call me Richard, uh, it was my mom and the IRS. And uh, but you can call me Rick, uh, good. sir. Uh, you know, uh, before we get into talking about uh, um, what is taking place in the Western nations, I mean, right now here with the United States, we you know we have a president that that has uh, very conflicted policies. Uh, I mean, he's he's making things extremely uh, convoluted in the Middle East. He's he's upsetting longtime allies. And he's aiding the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, What are your thoughts on on what Mr. Obama is doing in the Middle East? Well, his foreign policy is not working. Uh, You mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, In 2011, we had the Arab Spring, which would be called the Muslim Spring, because the Muslim Brotherhood just seized power in most of the nations in which the Arab Spring took place. And one of these was Egypt. Uh, From 1981 until 2011, we had Hosni Mubarak, the Egyptian president who was pro-West. He did not want to have the Muslim Brotherhood just around him in his cabinet. And then Mubarak was just deposed, and the Muslim Brotherhood just replaced him. And look what happened. And the situation got so bad that most Egyptians do not want the Muslim Brotherhood and are very upset with Obama for helping the Muslim Brotherhood assume power in Egypt. So his policies are just, like you said, they're conflicting with with Western values and with countries that that like Western values. Is he aligning with a specific sect or or group of Islam? 
I don't think he's a devout Muslim. I don't think he, I don't think he follows a specific sect of Islam. But I can tell you right now that I'm he's talking not, about his policies. Are his well, policies he's not lining up? His policies are not pro-American. He just has a global agenda. See, Barack Obama is a globalist. He thinks that America is just a country with a flag on it. He does not believe in American exceptionalism. Uh, he is the most foreign president we've ever seen. Yes, and so is Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State. She likes to visit Islamic countries and have a cup of tea with, with her enemies, but that's all she does. So, yes, this administration has a fantasy foreign policy, just believing that by being nice to our enemies, they're going to be nice back. That's it, not the case. Is there a, an alliance between the left and socialists and Islam? Oh, Absolutely. And I'll go further. There, the LGBT groups in San Francisco have joined forces with, with Islamic groups. Do they not understand that in a real Muslim country, gays and lesbians would be the first ones to be killed? See, they have a common enemy, and it operates on the principle of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the com common enemy is the white establishment, uh, the, the conservative establishment. So the left and radical organizations are joining forces with with Islam. And, and yet they're so naive that they don't comprehend that when the Islamic forces gain the numerical upper hand in this country, they will be uh at danger. They're gonna be they're gonna be ordered either to convert to Islam or they're gonna be they're gonna be decapitated. Absolutely, and it's happening right now in Europe, uh, Europe has a lot of Sharia zones or Sharia lands or no-go zones in which a lot of Muslims live in their micro-communities. Uh, if one of these gays and lesbians walks there, walks there uh, and is lost there, you know, they're going to be hurt. Like women who dress, you know, who, who, who wear skirts and dresses get harassed in those no-go zones. I saw a shocking video several days ago. I believe it was the London Telegraph. It may have been the Times where a young man was walking down the street. I think he was an American. The young guy looked like he was in his 20s. He was walking down the streets of London, and he was drinking a beer. And a Islamic neighborhood patrol group, now we're talking Islamic vigilantes, uh, jumped him. There was you know maybe four or five guys. They jumped him, and they beat him up. The, the man was minding his own business, walking down the sidewalk, but he was drinking a beer. But these Muslims decided, you're not allowed to do that. And, and so they, they just beat up the guy. Yeah, they have their own rules. Uh, they have their, their own Sharia courts. See, a Sharia court in a, is an Islamic court that operates outside British jurisprudence. H how so prevalent, what you just told me does not surprise me. Yes, how, how commonplace is this in Europe now? Well, they have a lot of these in England. Uh, they have polygamous Muslim families in England and France. See, they have so many Muslims there that governments have to say yes to to Sharia and to Islamic law. Now, don't get me wrong. No constitution in Europe has Sharia. So it's not just de jure, but it's definitely de facto, which means that it's in practice. It's not in law, but it's in practice, because Europe has 55 million Islamic immigrants, so it's one European out of eight who's Muslims. So it's safety by numbers. So so what we have now in, in Europe is a, is a dual legal system. Uh, you can say that, oh yeah, definitely in England and France, definitely. And, and, and the Western leaders are afraid to confront the, the acceptance they're, of Sharia in their countries. They're afraid, and they're overly politically correct. And that's the idea of globalism, the new world order, that all nations should abide, should, should follow one voice, one type of thought. Uh, Professor, has there been a conscious, deliberate strategy over decades to use uh, multiculturalism to, to break down traditional cultural barriers for the purpose of not integration, but for the purpose of destroying the, the cultures and their dominance over certain nations. That's what they're doing on the European continent. And multiculturalism has failed because a lot of people are angry with it. Who See, is behind it? Multiculturalism, by definition, is the idea that all cultures coexist and respect each other. 
If you have Islam in the mix, it's not going to work. Because Islam, the Quran says, chapter 9, verse 33, chapter 48, verse 28, chapter 61, verse 9, just to cite a few, the Quran is very clear. All other religions and cultures must be subjugated to Islam, because Islam is superior to every other way of life. I can't think of one Islamic dominant nation on the planet where I'd like to live. I mean, I can think of a lot of nations. You know, if I if I if I moved out of America, there are, there are a lot of wonderful nations I'd, I'd I'd enjoy living in. I can't think of one Islamic nation I'd want to live in. You know, forty and fifty years ago, living in Syria, Egypt, Turkey, that was easy because these places fifty years ago were tolerant. But now there is an Islamic resurgence, like an awakening, like a revival. Uh, Turkey, for example, has a prime minister whose name is Erdogan, and he wants to Im- to impose Islamism and Sharia. And as a result, a lot of Turkish youth are rebelling. They're demonstrating in the streets. So it's getting worse and worse, as opposed to, to what it was 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. What, uh, who is behind this multicultural movement? The Muslim Brotherhood. They, See, the are you saying they brother, invented this whole movement? No, they did not invent it. That's a, no, who, but multiculturalism who, who, is a Western notion. But the Muslim Brotherhood, which is 85 years old, is the largest Islamic movement in the world. Uh, it, it has created terrorist groups, and by the same token, it, it also believes in civilization jihad. The idea that Western values have to be turned against themselves. So basically, in layperson's terms, Western civilization need, needs to be de- destroyed from within. And how do you do that? By imposing political correctness laws, by imposing freedom of speech restrictions laws, things of that nature. And multiculturalism is part of that. But who do you think was originally behind the whole concept of multiculturalism? Uh, I don't know. I don't think there was one single person. Or I, uh, I don't mean a person, but a group. Where did this originate? Because, that's, because that's, it's, it's, it's a cultural suicide policy. Oh, it is cultural suicide. It's definitely the left, if I can answer the question, is the left. Mm -hmm. Because the left, as we discussed 10 minutes ago, the left is in bed with Islam. Because they're looking for any ally that hates the same enemy. You get it. Yeah, you got it. This is is what we've been saying on this program for years. And this is is what's taking place. How how deep uh, of... The Islam, how deep is the Islamic penetration in America right now? It's not as deep as it is in Europe, because for one thing, in the United States, it's only two and a half million American Muslims who live who live here. That's zero point six percent of the population. So safety by numbers is not the case here. Uh, however, the average Muslim is wealthier than the average uh, non-Muslim American family. So they hold key, they hold key positions. They own gas stations, they own hotels, a lot of them are doctors and surgeons, and they hold key positions in the seven branches, seven key agencies in the U.S., like NASA, the Department of Justice, the Pentagon, the White House, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. By infiltrating these agencies, they can try just to to pass those freedom of speech restriction laws and, and other subversive laws. How do so many Muslims come into the United States and, you know, it seems like the first week that they're here, they already own stores and and convenience uh, stores and and shops. And how is this done? I mean, you've got American citizens are saying that, you know, they've worked here all their lives. They've lived here and worked and paid their taxes and they, they still haven't been able to buy a business. And yet somebody comes in from an Islamic country and suddenly owns, you know, the hotel. They own the convenience stores. How does that why. happen? I'll tell you what. The trend is brain drain. Brain drain is just a human capital flight. So those people with the gray matter and uh, education and skills and money flock to the United States. And those poor Muslims, most of them are, but those poor Muslims flock to Europe. In a country like France, you go there for four months, you get health care benefits for free, unemployment benefits for free, and all the goodies. In the United States, even though this country is moving towards socialism, it's not, it's not the French situation yet. Uh, so wealthy Muslims tend to move to the U.S., 
poor Muslims tend to move to Europe. Are they, do, uh, do you think there's any possibility that these Muslims have investment capital from um, Islamic intelligence services or, or something? Oh, there's no question. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just seems logical that uh, somebody is financing a lot of Muslims to come into this country and buy up businesses. Well, Saudi Arabia, see, Saudi Arabia is financing a lot of mosques and worship centers and Islamic schools. Uh, that's factual. You can trace sure. back. You can trace. You can trace that. And we've had both parties, uh, the Bush family, deeply connected to uh, the Saudi Arabians, and uh, so is uh, Mr. Obama. And uh, you can trace uh, that connection back to his uh, his college days. Uh, yeah, and uh, to your point, uh, for the past 10 to 15 years, both Republicans and Democrats have treated Islam the same way. It's politically correct. Uh, if you remember the day after 9-11, what did Bush say? He went to a mosque and he said that Islam is a religion of peace. A day after 3,000 people were killed by uh, that Islamist group, Al-Qaeda. And, and while... Americans were still in the rubble, and smoke was still swirling around uh, the Trade Center and the Pentagon. The, the FBI was rounding up uh, with limousines. They were picking up uh, the bin Laden family and flew them out of the United States. That's correct. Now, bin Laden had 21 siblings. So a lot of them had rejected him even 10 years before he did 9-11. But still, you're right, it's... It's fishy, you know. You're yeah, right. yeah. I mean, it, it didn't make sense. I said, why? Why is the government it, with this crisis going on? Why are they concerned about the Bin Laden family? Why did they direct FBI agents to go gather up the Bin Laden family and fly well, them like out of the United uh, States? The Bush family had ties to Saudi Arabia. That's right. That's right. Um, what are you hearing about uh, the next wave of Somali refugees coming to the United States? Well, a lot of them have uh, are just they're being welcomed by Minnesota and states in the Midwest. Yeah, you know, uh, if they adapt to our culture, uh, that's fine. If they refuse to adapt and they have their just Sharia zones and no-go zones, that's going to be a problem. So there's no telling at this point, but I don't think it's a good idea for a country that's profoundly anti-Western just to to send its people there. Or I shouldn't say to send its people, because we are welcoming them here. I don't think it's a good idea. Well, we just witnessed that horrible massacre in the Nairobi Mall several weeks ago, and right. that was by Somali uh, Islamic jihadists. And um, the mainstream news media in the United States quickly... Um, squelched all discussion of the possibility that some of these terrorists came from Minnesota. Yes, so basically they were, they were Somali refugees living in Minnesota who flew there just to fight in the mall. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. See, just because, and that was my point, just because you welcome enemies into your country does not mean they're going to just... Uh, be thankful to you and be graceful. Um, they're not going the to. Culture, they're not going to assimilate into this. Think. They're not Go going ahead. to assimilate into this culture. No. Their their strategy and their purpose is to force America to assimilate into Islamic culture. For for a lot of them, that's the case. Yes. And that's what's happening in England and and throughout Europe. Absolutely. I've been saying the same thing for years. When people go to Paris, they go see the Eiffel Tower and Versailles and the Louvre's, but you're not going to find the, the Muslim problem there. I want them to live in Paris for a year and that they walk across the city. It's, they'll have a different opinion than just a tourist vacation for three days in Versailles. Um, what, what, kind of, um, what kind of resistance are you getting uh, as you speak out? Uh, not so much from my university. Uh, my administrators, you know, they tend to be neutral. I mean, but it's more by outside groups like CARE. See, CARE is the Council on American Islamic Relations. And, uh, they've been attacking me for five months, four or five months, just calling me a bigot and idiot and hate monger. Uh, they can do whatever they want. See, CARE is like a broken record. They always say the same things over and over again. So that's the type of resistance I have encountered. Do you um, do they harass you 
Do, I mean, do you ever feel like you're being well, stalked? Recently, on October 1st, one of the care representatives, whose name is Samantha Bowden, she's a young white girl, she's about 25, and she's a recent Muslim convert. She married a, a Muslim man. Uh, she's the communication and outreach director for care. And when I was teaching, she was sitting at the back of my class. She had never made any contact with me. She never received any permission from me. Uh, I asked her to leave, and it, it took me a while before she left. But she was just intruding my class. She wasn't a student? No, she's, she, she was not a student. She has never been a UCF student. That's she's illegal. An outside agitator. That's so you it, call that stalking. That's illegal. You can't walk into somebody's class uninvited. It's Florida statutes. It's against UCF regulations. It, she had no legal right to be in my class. I had this years ago when I started, Professor, in, in, in the late 90s in Dallas, Fort Worth, and I was speaking out about the Holy Land Foundation. And I, would, I was being followed throughout DFW as I was giving speeches. And, uh, you know, I would look out into the audience while I was speaking, and I'd see these young Muslim men taking notes and getting up and leaving, coming back in. And, uh, you know, um, it was just creepy. And I couldn't get anybody back then, to, you know, to take me serious uh, that that there was a, a terrorist organization connected to Hamas operating out of Dallas-Fort Worth. And, and, you know, those guys didn't go to prison until several years after 9-11. Uh, so it's much worse today, and I've had death threats. I've, you know, I've received death threats from Muslims. I've had Muslims praying uh, on the parking lot of my office, and um, it's it's spooky. It's spooky. These these now, people. Now the good news, yes, sir. So there's always a silver lining. The good news is that Americans are becoming increasingly aware of the the wolf in sheep's clothing of the just the the threat posed by by jihad and Sharia in the United States. And uh, after Samantha Bowden was caught stalking me, I mean, just she was interviewed about that. If you look at the YouTube video, it has over a th- over 4,000 views. So the, the YouTube is circulating. Uh, is there any possibility that, that the door will be shut in this country to, to Islamic uh, immigration? No, because if that happens... I mean, they're going to file a lawsuit with the federal court or with the United Nations. They will invoke the First Amendment, you know, freedom of religion. So uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, Well, then that sounds like they're just going to keep coming. Well, as long as, you know, if Hillary Clinton wins the election in 2016, and as you know, she has a good chance of becoming the president, I think the situation may be exacerbated. Worse than under Obama. It would be at least the same. I don't think it would be better. It would be the same or worse. Do, do you have any thoughts about uh, the new CIA director, John Brennan? Well, as you know, rumor has it that he converted to Islam when yes. he lived in the Middle East. Yes. Uh, I don't know if there is solid evidence. If that's the case, if really he is, if he's a Muslim, if he's a devout Muslim, and uh, that's frightening because he's the head of the CIA. How high up in Homeland Security are Muslims currently positioned? Well, the, I, can, I can answer your question by saying that groups like CARE and ISNA, the Islamic Society uh, of North America, are doing everything they can to remove instructors or to get them dismissed. Those instructors that use Islam and terrorism in the same sentence get dismissed. Like I, it would be difficult for for someone like me just to become an instructor in our military. It seems so bizarre, doesn't it? We call that civilization jihad. See, there are many types of jihad. You have holy jihad, that's suicide bombing and just flying planes into buildings. And then you have civilization jihad, that's destroying our civilization from within. And that's what most people need to wake up to, just civilization jihad. And the, the, it's a huge problem. And it's a deliberate plan. It's a deliberate strategy. They're, they're working. It's like termites just eating away at the foundation of a society. Oh, it's a grand, let's say it's a grand scheme. It's a huge agenda. And what is, the, what is the total overall grand scheme? Is it a worldwide Islamic caliphate? Oh, it's caliphate? worldwide. Oh, definitely. It's worldwide. Oh, yeah. See, the, the, the ultimate objective of the Muslim Brotherhood is to cover the globe with Islamic flags, to make sure that every country follows Sharia. 
Sharia is Islamic law. Sharia will tell you how to walk, how to talk, uh, how to dress. Women have, will have way fewer rights. What part of the world right now is the least Islamic? A country like Japan. See, you live in Japan, you're Muslim, uh, you don't become Japanese. You can vote, you have fewer rights. See, the Japanese understand the Islamic threat. Uh, you may call them racist or whatever. So, you know, they're not taking any risk in regards to Islam. I think what they're doing is smart. What about South America? Uh, increasingly, Muslims are moving into South America. Uh, in the TBA, the tri-border area mm-hmm. uh, between Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. And uh, See, the problem with South American countries is that in a lot of cases, there is a rule of law, but it's not enforced. It's really lax. You could see that with the Medellin cartels uh, back in the 90s with Pablo Escobar uh, in, in northeastern mm-hmm. Colombia. So it's there is a rule of law, but you know corruption is very high there. And and how how deeply connected are the drug cartels with the jihadists? Oh, they're deeply connected. See, drug cartels provide money, and with the money, uh, you know, you give weapons to the jihadists. And in exchange, you know, just they're smuggling through our borders. And this explains why we, we're seeing the drug cartels uh, revert to uh, resort to beheadings now in Mexico. Well, I had no idea that happened. Uh, Mexico is a, basically it's a hub for drug cartels, for jihadism, because what's nor- north of Mexico? It's the United States. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a lot yeah. of beheadings in Mexico now. Oh, I had no idea. Well, yes. you're teaching me something. I'm a going lot, to do some reading yes, on that. A lot of beheadings uh, connected to the drug cartels. And so they had to learn it somewhere. Uh, hey, uh, one last question. What do you, what do you think of uh, Facebook uh, last week said, uh, you know, uh, beheading videos are okay now? Well, if you type beheading video on Google, you'll see everything. Nothing is edited. So I'm not surprised that Facebook allows that. But isn't that bizarre? Isn't that bizarre? It's bizarre. See, I believe in freedom of information. So in a sense, it would make people aware of how our enemy operates. But it's bizarre. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, my guest uh, is uh, Professor Jonathan Matusis, and we appreciate you uh, coming by True News today. Keep speaking out, sir. We appreciate your truthfulness. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for having me. I hope I can do it again. Well, we're nearing the close of today's newscast. And, you know, there's something that I seldom mention on this program. Earlier this year, we started producing a two-minute True News Top of the Hour update. And those updates are heard on about 350 radio stations across the USA. It added a lot of work to our workday, but a lot of new people have been introduced to True News by hearing these news breaks. Here are some of the cities and stations where you can hear the True News updates over the Christian Satellite Network affiliates. Again, it's just a partial list. In Alabama, Athens, 102.5 FM, Huntsville, 89.7 FM. In Arizona, Bullhead City and Laughlin, Nevada, 89.9. In Phoenix, 91.9. Yuma, 90.1 FM. Arkansas, Jonesboro, 91.5. In California, Desert Hot Springs, 105.5, Mount Shasta, uh, uh, 101.3, Redding, 92.9, Victorville, 90.3. In Colorado, Grand Junction, 88.9, Connecticut, Norwalk, 88.5. Here in Florida, Key West, 89.3, West Palm Beach, 88.5, Jacksonville, 91.3, And the list goes on and on and on. God bless. See you tomorrow.